ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار so as we approach the final 10 days or the final 10 nights of ramadan which are the best of the nights of the entire year it's a time for us to try to make the most of increasing our iman and benefiting in a manner that is going to be lasting after Ramadan. And the theme of this conference is centered, or this uh, seminar today, is centered around the heart. The heart which is the foundation of all of the body, all of the limbs are subservient to the body, the heart is the king as we shall see shortly inshallah ta'ala. And so the heart, the heart which is the foundation of a person's iman, of the, the actions of the heart such as love and fear and hope, they are what provide the spring for the rest of a person's actions. And for that reason, a person who does not attend to his heart, does not take care as to what he fills his heart with, does not take care as to what uh, statements his heart believes, meaning matters of belief and creed, and does not take care with respect to the actions or the states or the feelings that pass through his heart, then this person will have a sick heart or an ill heart. So, in this short brief reminder, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to try to take some benefit from some, from some speech of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. And as you know, those from the scholars who have written extensively and expertly on this topic are the likes of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and likewise Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. And that's why everybody who speaks, who wants to speak about the heart, and the soul, they will return back to the speech of these two great Imams. And because they have written extensively, uh, our brother uh, Salim, likewise myself, and perhaps even Abu Mu'adh Taqweem, may draw upon the words, the same uh, words, or the, the same general resources. So what we want to do, inshallah ta'ala, is just to try and take some benefit from some of the kalam of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, and it, it all centers around the heart, and we'll start, uh, this is taken from his book, uh, the book itself is called Tibul Qulub, it's a compilation of various statements of Ibn al-Qayyim from numerous parts in his, in his works. So the first point we want to begin with, which Ibn al-Qayyim makes, is that Allah Azawajal, he did not create the creation without purpose, and he did not create them and didn't neglect them. Rather, he made them as people who are responsible. So they are responsible. They have the burden of uh, acting and abiding. And he made them subject to commands and prohibitions. Commands and prohibitions. And then he made them to understand or he uh, imposed upon them to understand that which they need to do and that which they need to keep away from, both in a general sense and a detailed sense. And how is this? He did this by sending them revelation. He sent them revelation. Right? So he didn't create them without purpose. Rather, he tasked them with obedience and keeping away from disobedience. And then he made them understand these commands. By how? By sending them messengers. And they explained affairs in a general sense 
and in a detailed sense. Then he divided them into those who are Sa'id, who will be happy and successful, and those who are Shaqi, those who will be miserable, and those who will be wretched. And for each of these two groups, he made an abode, a place or a destination. And he then gave them the various components or the means by which they can acquire knowledge and by which they can act upon knowledge. Right? What does this mean? It means he gave them a heart. So he gave you a heart and he gave you hearing and he gave you seeing and he gave you limbs. So all of these affairs enable you to know, first of all, to have knowledge, and secondly, for you to act. To have knowledge and to act. Ilm and amal. Ilm and amal. So these affairs that Allah has bestowed us with, we are tasked by Allah to abide by His commands and to keep away from His prohibitions. Then He goes on to explain that those people who used all of these affairs, the heart, the hearing, the seeing, the limbs, in Allah's obedience, and they did not turn away from that, then they have established the shukr, the gratefulness to Allah Zawajal for the things which He gave them. Right? So the person who used these affairs to remain in Allah's obedience, then he has fulfilled his obligation of being grateful to Allah for these bounties and favors which he bestowed upon him. And the path he has chosen is the path which Allah is pleased with. And as for that person who on the other hand, he used these faculties, the heart, the hearing, the seeing, the limbs, he used them to follow his desires. And he did not observe the right that Allah has upon him in relation to these affairs. Then this person, when Allah asks him on Yawm al Qiyamah, then he will feel pain. He will feel grief when he's questioned. And he will suffer from a prolonged period of sadness. And this is because the hisab. The accounting, it is something that will inevitably take place. And it will take place in relation to these limbs. So when you are raised and brought in front of Allah Azawajal, you will be held accountable for these specific limbs. The heart, the hearing, the seeing, and likewise the various limbs. And that's why we see in the Qur'an, he quotes an ayah in Surah Al-Isra, "Inna sam'a wal basara wal fu'ada kullu ulaika kana anhu mas'ula." Indeed, the hearing and the seeing and the fu'ad, which is the the heart and you know the faculties of the heart and understanding, all of that will be inquired into. So this is the first affair that we should be aware of. The second thing that we should be aware of is the status and the position of the heart itself in relation to everything else. And the heart is the king which administers and which commands, just like we have the king who administers the, the soldiers. And the soldiers, whatever they do, is from the commands of the king. Then likewise, the heart is the same. The heart has a central location in the body. All of the limbs are centered around it and point towards it. And all of these limbs are under the servitude of the heart. They become upright or they become deviated based upon the state and the condition of the heart itself. And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allah wa inna fil jasadi mudra, ida saluhat, salah al jasadu kulluh. Indeed, there is 
in the body, a morsel of flesh, which if it is rectified, or upright, or correct, or, or righteous, then all of the body will be rectified, or correct, or upright, and so on and so forth. So the king is the heart. The heart is the king of all of the limbs. And the, the various actions of a person will not be upright up until the heart itself is upright in terms of its qasd and its niyyah. The heart, it intends, it desires things. And when it intends and desires that which Allah likes and is pleased with, then the rest of the limbs can never ever be upright and rectified. So that's why the, the heart is the central location and the central focus of everything. And a person will be asked about these limbs because every, every shepherd has a flock and every shepherd will be asked about his flock. And for that reason, Ibn al-Qayyim says that those people who proceed to Allah, the Salikin, the ones who are traveling to Allah, their utmost concern is with the heart. Is with the heart. And then he explains another point which adds to this and which emphasizes this. And this is the fact that Iblis, may Allah curse him, he knew because he saw Adam when he was created. He came and he circulated around him and he looked at him. Iblis, he knows that the central focus in the human is the heart. The heart is the center of everything. The heart is what makes a human function, what makes a human tick in both ways. Both in terms of the physical sense, we know that the heart pumps blood around the body and it keeps you alive. This oxygen reaches every cell in the body and it keeps you alive. So the heart is the pump, so it keeps you alive from the physical sense. However, our knowledge of the heart goes above and beyond the knowledge in a worldly sense. This is just the worldly knowledge to do with the heart. There is something additional, which is what Allah has informed us of, which is that the heart is life in another sense. Life in terms of iman. Life in terms of belief in Allah. Life in terms of righteousness. So the heart also has that element. And so Iblis, he knew this, or he knows this. He knows that the heart is the central you know, uh, axis of everything. And for that reason, when Iblis, he attacks, then he comes straight to the heart. His focus is around the heart. And that's why when he comes, he brings the waswas, the whispering. He brings it to a person, to the person's ears. It comes and enters into his heart. Likewise, he brings the shahawat, the desires and the lusts. He brings them to the heart. He beautifies them. And likewise, certain actions, he beautifies them. And certain feelings, he beautifies them. All of these things he brings right to the heart so that they prevent him from the path. The path of obedience to Allah. And the path of keeping away from disobedience to Allah in which there is benefit for the servant in this life. And likewise in the hereafter. So, Iblis he then brings all of the means of deviation, misguidance, and swerving from the truth. And all of these cut him off from being su successful in his path towards Allah Azza wa Jal. So, Iblis attacks in such a way that even if a person does not fall into his traps, he will not leave him until he actually makes a slip or an error. Right? There's one thing being misguided and going astray in terms of falling into sin or falling into innovation. That's one thing. But even that, his plot is so thick and so persistent that he won't stop until he even makes you just even make a slip or a, a mistake. He will try to get you like that as well. So what does this all tell us? This leads us to the next point, which is that the only way a servant can escape from all of this is by constant, constantly seeking isti'ana from Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the first thing. That you seek aid from Allah Azza wa Jal. As we say in Surah Al-Fatiha, 
We worship you alone, and from you alone do we seek aid in worshipping you. So that's the first thing, seeking constant isti'ana from Allah Azawajal, and always going towards those affairs which please Allah Azawajal. And likewise, the heart seeking refuge in Allah, and likewise striving to have ubudiya to Allah, meaning that the heart now is enslaved only to Allah Azawajal. And when a person when a person makes his heart to be enslaved to Allah Azawajal, then he comes under an ayah in the Quran. This ayah in the in the Quran establishes for us how we escape this plot of Iblis La'anahullah. In this ayah Allah Azawajal he says, Inna ibadi, this is now speaking to Iblis. Inna ibadi laysa laka alihim sultan. Over my servants you will have no authority. Think about this now. In this ayah, first of all, Allah Azawajal has ascribed to himself some from his servants, those who are in ubudiya to him, those whose hearts are subservient and is an enslaved to Allah Azawajal. Those people who have that quality, who have that characteristic, Iblis can never ever have any authority over those people. He cannot harm those people. He cannot misguide those people. His whispers cannot affect those people. So here is one of two things in the Quran that Allah has mentioned, which are a protection from Iblis. So this first one is Al-Ubudiyya, servitude to Allah Azawajal. And so Ibn Al-Qayyim says that here when Allah Azawajal, when he made this idafa, when he, when he ascribed the servants to himself, this idafa is something that cuts off the shayateen from the servant. This ubudiya. And likewise, when a person achieves this ubudiya, he will then feel ikhlas to Allah Azza wa Jal. Sincerity to Allah Azza wa Jal. This leads us now to the second verse in the Quran. The second quality and the second characteristic. And this quality is in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. Again, Addressing Iblis, la'anahullah, when he expelled him, he said, "Illa ibadaka minhumul mukhlasin." In other words, it is it is Iblis saying that I will misguide all of them. I will misguide every last one of them, except, and he made an exception, "Illa ibadaka minhum minhum al mukhlasin," except those from amongst your servants. And then the Mufassireen, they have different uh, interpretations. Some say those whom Allah Azawajal, He chooses. And some say those, it means those who are, have ikhlas, who are sincere to Allah in their ibadah, and who seek only the pleasure of Allah Azawajal. So from these two ayat, what do we understand? We understand that there are two things which save and protect a servant from Iblis, whose attack is upon the heart of an individual. And these two things are first of all, ubudiyah to Allah Azawajal, in that a person worships Allah, and his heart is enslaved to Allah alone, and it is not attached to other things from the worldly affairs, to other deities, for example, committing shirk, or to you know, uh, relations such as a wife or a husband or children. Or to material things, like wealth, for example. His heart is preoccupied with wealth. Or the pursuit of authority and power and status and position. These are the various things which a person can become attached to. And they divert him away from the path of Allah Azawajal. So these two affairs, ikhlas and ubudiyah, when they settle and are established in the heart, then they are a protection from iblis who wants to have an open avenue towards your heart. Once this is clear, we then move to the second uh, section, and I'll just very quickly summarize all of this, because perhaps you've already heard this in the previous lesson. As you know, the scholars divide the heart into three types. There is the sound heart, the healthy heart. This heart is the one, uh, this heart is the one which is salim, 
إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart the word salim there the is salim and there is salim when you have the word salim it is referring to an established quality a sifa which is thabita in a person right so this is the specific uh, meaning of this this particular form of of of, of the verb or this noun so it is fa'il salim which means that the sifa has become established in a person so when your heart is Salim, and this means that this heart is free of shahawat, it is free of shubuhat, it is the heart which puts the command and the prohibition of Allah in front of everything else, it is the heart in which there is no share to any other thing or any other being besides Allah Azza wa Jal, it is the heart whose action is sincerely for Allah, if he loves, he loves for Allah, if he hates, he hates for Allah. If he gives, he gives for the sake of Allah. If he withholds, he withholds for the sake of Allah. Likewise, all the various other qualities of worship, tawakkul, love, fear, hope, reliance, and so on and so forth. This is the heart which is living by virtue of all of these affairs. And this is the first, first type of heart. The second type of heart is completely opposite to this one. It is the heart which is completely dead. It is dead. Even though it is pumping blood, that's just the physical aspect of it. But it is dead from the other more important aspect. And so this heart is dry. It is dead. It does not know its Lord. It does not worship its Lord. Rather, it follows and pursues its desires. Whatever the desires take it, it follows in that direction. Even if it means entailing the anger and the dislike of Allah Azza wa Jal. This type of heart is not bothered about this affair. Rather, wherever its desires take it, then it will, it will follow in that direction. So this type of heart is the one which worships other than Allah, loves other than Allah, fears other than Allah, is pleased with other than Allah, becomes angry, venerates other than Allah. All of these affairs, this heart provides for other than Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is the dead heart, a completely dead heart. And then we have the third type of heart which is in between those two. And this is the heart which has life from one angle, but it is sick and ill from another angle. From one angle, it has iman in Allah. It loves Allah. It has something of ikhlas to Allah, reliance upon Allah. All of this is the element which gives its life. But then on the other side, it has shahawat, it loves certain desires, and it pursues them and wants to fulfill them. And likewise, there are other certain poisons in the heart. There is the poison, there is the poison of, a uh, quick announcement, please can the following car be moved as soon as possible. It is MK18, MK18, KFO. That's registration MK18KFO. Could you move this car straight away, please? It is causing obstruction. So, the heart, so from one angle it has life, which is iman in Allah and the various other actions, ikhlas, and so on and so forth to a certain degree. But it also has pursuit of shahawat. And there are specific poisons that prevent it. For example, the poison of al hasad, of envy. The prohibited type of envy. This is a poison in the heart. Likewise, al-kibr, arrogance. The heart might have something of arrogance. It might have al amazement with oneself. When the heart becomes, or when a person becomes amazed with himself and with his achievements, or with his power, or his wealth, or his whatever. Or this heart might love seeking authority and leadership upon the earth. All of these things are things which cause the heart to become ill and sick, even in the presence, despite the presence of Iman itself. So summarizing all of this, basically we have three types of heart. The first heart that we mentioned is a heart which is Hayyun, Mukhbit, Layyin, Wa'in. It is a heart which is living, it is submitting to Allah, it is soft 
and gentle and it is wa'in meaning it is open and receives and understands and comprehends what is put into it and secondly we have the heart which is dead and dry like you have twigs when they fall off the tree over time there's no water coming to them there's no from the roots there's no attachment and eventually it dries it becomes hard it becomes stiff it withers it is dry and it is dead and thirdly the heart which has something of this and it has something of this it has life from one angle but it also has illness it is sick and so this type of heart will fluctuate sometimes it'll be closer to health and sometimes it'll be closer to illness sometimes it'll be closer to to dying even and this is the nature of this type of heart which is the sick heart this now leads us to uh, I want to really round off now because to leave uh, time for the remaining uh, final lecture inshallah ta'ala and I just want to finish off by mentioning some of the traits and qualities of a sound heart of a heart which is sound and which is healthy and which is living and these traits which we should try to develop and uh, strengthen inshallah ta'ala so that our hearts remain healthy inshallah ta'ala so the first of them is that the sound heart the healthy heart is something that always chooses the beneficial over the harmful a person should always be thinking this deed this action this statement this food this drink is it going to benefit me or is it going to harm me so the person always has this outlook that the heart will always choose that which is beneficial over that which is harmful and there are two things that a heart receives first of all nutrition which is the nutrition of iman and secondly the medicine which is the medicine of the quran and you already heard this in the previous lecture iman is the heart's nutrition and the quran is the heart's medicine also from the qualities and traits is that the heart is always looking towards the hereafter the heart's concern is the hereafter we see in the statement of the messenger of allah sallam kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib aw abir sabil be in the world as if you are a stranger or someone who is upon a journey we have the statement of Ali bin Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu who said indeed the world has departed and it's, it's turning that way and the hereafter is coming meaning it's approaching this way and both of these abodes they have their children both of these abodes have their children so be from the children of the hereafter and do not be from the children of the world for indeed today fa inna al-yawm amalun wala hisab for in for indeed today there is action and there is no accounting and tomorrow wa ghadan hisabun wala amal and tomorrow there will be accounting and there will be no action action will finish and it will it will end so the second quality of of a sound heart is that the heart is always focused upon the hereafter it is always looking towards the hereafter and it considers itself in the life of this world as if on a temporary journey a very short journey and nothing more third quality of the sound heart is that the heart is always disturbing and bothering the person meaning it is it is pricking you all the time and bothering you all the time and making you turn to allah to repent to allah to be submissive to allah right so the heart is is causing you disturbance there's some disturbance in your heart and it's telling you repent turn to allah seek forgiveness and this type of connection is a connection where you have the one that loves and the one whom uh, and the one whom it loves right the connection of love is very very strong and and tight and so the heart is like this it is attached to allah and it makes a person compelled to seek forgiveness and to turn to allah this is where there is life to the heart 
and success to the heart and happiness to the heart in all of these affairs. So the heart is something that leads a person to want to repent to Allah. Likewise, from the affairs, and we see this from a number of athar from the Salaf, uh, from them is the statement of Abu Hussein al-Warraq, Hayatul Qalb fi dhikr al-Hay al-ladhi la yamut. The life of the heart, what, what does it lie in? It lies in the remembrance of al-Hay, the ever-living, who never dies. In this lies the life of the heart. Also from the qualities and traits of a sound heart, is that the heart never tires from the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. Dhikr is something that a servant is always engaged in. Whether that be or the opportunities in which he ought to make dhikr, whether that is after the salah, whether that is in the morning, whether that is in the evening, the morning and evening adhkar, whether he is sitting, whether he is standing, whether he is lying, he remembers Allah Azza wa Jal. Whether by way of his thoughts he thinks about the bounties of Allah, the creation of Allah, the favors of Allah, and all of the phenomena around him, and he thinks to himself that none of this is in vain, or whether he remembers with his tongue, with the various adhkar that we find in the, in the sunnah, after the salawat, or in specific instances with the rain, for example, entering the house, leaving the house, and so on and so forth, or the morning and evening, evening uh, adhkar. All of these things, a servant, he abides and he sticks by these, by these affairs because they are uh, uh, signs of a sound heart. Likewise, from the signs of a sound heart is if a person misses a remembrance, if he misses his daily routine of remembering Allah, then he feels such pain which is greater than the pain a person feels than the loss of wealth. Think about this. If you have ever lost wealth, if you have ever lost wealth or a significant amount of wealth, think about the pain and the stress that you may have felt. A believer who has a sound heart, when he misses something from the deeds of righteousness, for example, the dhikr that he routinely performs on a daily basis, and, for one, and on one day for some reason he misses that, then he feels pain, such pain, more so than if a person was to leave, uh, was to lose some wealth. So this, if you experience this feeling, this feeling is a sign of a sound heart, of a healthy living heart. Likewise, from the signs of a sound heart is when it enters into the salah, as soon as you say at takbir the takbir Allahu Akbar, and you enter into the prayer, standing in front of Allah Azza wa Jal, then you depart from the dunya, you leave the dunya, all of your concerns, your worries, your stresses, your anxieties that you have in the worldly affairs, they disappear from you. They are forgotten. Right? When you're standing in front of Allah, there's no anxiety or stress or worry or concern or any thought about the worldly affairs, they are gone as soon as you enter the prayer. And the most severest thing upon you is to leave the prayer. You don't want to leave the prayer. That's the most severest thing, to, to leave the state in which you are in, in which you are standing, bowing, prostrating, remembering Allah with all of those, the, the, the statements, the Fatiha, and likewise in the Ruku, and the Sujood, and the Tashahud, and so on and so forth. All of these things are a tremendous pleasure to you. And so if you find this, this pleasure and this repose and this bliss, then this is a sign that your heart is sound and it is living. Also from its signs is that the heart's concern is only one. It is Allah Azza wa Jal. Also from the signs of its healthiness is that the heart is severely concerned with its time. It does not want its time to be wasted in anything, in anything trivial in anything non-beneficial, more so than a person that you find from the people of the world who do not want to lose any of their wealth. You find a person, he is so concerned with his wealth, even if he loses a pound or 50 pence or whatever else, you find him grieving and at loss, right? And he's concerned in such a manner that he doesn't want to leave, lose anything, even the slightest amount of profit. 
But a believer whose heart is sound, he will not allow any moment of his time to go to waste. In anything trivial or non-beneficial. When the heart is like this, this is a sign that the heart is sound and healthy and living. And also from the signs of the heart is that the heart's concern is with correcting the action rather than the action itself. Tasheeh al-amal. That the heart, it wants the action to be correct rather than just acting. What does this mean? This means that the action has to be with ikhlas, with sincerity. It has to be with mutaba'a. It has to be out of obedience to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi It has to maintain al-ihsan. That you observe that when, when you perform the righteous deed, it is as if you are seeing Allah even though you do not see Him, though He sees you. Right? So this is what the heart is concerned with. Not action itself, in and of itself, but action that is correct and acceptable to Allah and in which there is the element of al-ihsa, al-ihsan, which is excellence and you know doing the action in the best possible way. So all of these are the signs of a sound and healthy heart and the traits and qualities of a healthy heart which we should observe. And finally we'll finish with one beautiful fa'idah from Ibn al-Qayyim because the heart is affected by things around it by the people you interact with, by the people you mix with, and sometimes you might not realize why your heart is in the state and condition it is. Why is it hard? Why is it not remembering Allah Azawajal? And you know, why, do you, why, do, why are you not able to find khushu in the salah, for example? Why are you not able to feel pleased and rushing towards to, to do good deeds, for example? Sometimes these states and conditions pass upon a certain a person's heart, and maybe he can't figure out and fathom why is this happening to me? Of course, the reasons are numerous. There are sins, there is you know, many, many things. But one of those factors that people neglect is the factor of company. And Ibn al-Qayyim mentions this issue in relation to the heart. And we'll finish with this inshallah ta'ala. So basically, Ibn al-Qayyim explains that the company is of four types. There are four types of company that you can take. And he gives a parable for each one. The first type of company is the one whose company is like nutrition. It is food for you. And what is this company? This is company of the alim, the scholar. This is the alim who gives you ilm. When you are in need of this uh, you know, of knowledge or understanding or something in the affairs of the deen, then you turn to the alim. This is nutrition. This is something that you can never ever do without. Just like with food, you need food and drink. On a daily basis. Likewise with the company of an alim. You cannot do without the alim. So every time you have a need. You have a question. You are ignorant about something. You are confused about something. You have a misconception about something. You need guidance. Then you go to the alim. And you ask. So this now is your nutrition. You take it whenever you need it. The second type is. That person whose company is like. Medicine. It is like medicine. And when you are ill, you seek that medicine. But as long as you are healthy, you do not need that medicine. Right? So there are some people, you don't need their company all the time. You only need their company when you are ill or when you are in need. Right? So this type of person, Ibn al-Qaim says, is affairs, for example, in the worldly affairs. Um, you need certain people uh, to rectify your worldly affairs or various mu'amalat, musharakat, al-istishara, you know, things to do with dealings, uh, uh, partnerships, things like that. Those affairs by which your worldly affairs are put aright. Right? So you go to these people as and when you need them. But you don't go to them all the time. Otherwise, they will become like a disease upon you, a harm upon you if you mix with them all the time. Only go to them when you need to fix that particular thing that you need fixing in the affairs of the world. That's the second type of company. Third type of company is the one whose mixing is a disease of various levels. It can be strong, it can be weak. And some people are those, they can give you a fatal illness. 
and others are those they can give you a light illness, right? So it varies in between all of these things. So the point being, Ibn al Qayyim says that the people vary in all of this. Some of them, they are fatal. Others, they can cause you intense pain. Others, they can give you, diff- you know, different types of illnesses. So these kind of people, you have to avoid them at all costs. They are those who do not benefit you in the world, nor do they benefit you in the dunya. They are people of evil, who waste time, and you know, so on and so forth. In a nutshell, that is. And finally, the fourth are those people who will cause you death. And this death does not mean the worldly death, we mean the death of the heart itself. And who are these people? These are the people of innovation, the people of misguidance, the people of deviation, the people who withhold you from the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallam, and they call to what opposes all of that. In all of this is death to your heart. So you have to avoid this company, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the most severe and the most intense of ways. So with that, we'll conclude here because the time as, as, is, is passing uh, and we'll conclude with that inshallah ta'ala and we'll leave uh, the place now for our brother Abu Mu'adh to come and benefit us from uh, what he has with him inshallah ta'ala. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.